Barely six months after Barbara Hambly's Children of the Jedi introduced Callista, the great love of Luke's life, Kevin J. Anderson's Darksaber came along to essentially break them up. Darksaber was the second hardcover release in 1995, and it featured another beautiful cover by Drew Struzan. What I find odd, though, is that this is now the fourth cover in 1995 that features Leia in her white Empire Strikes Back garb. Darksaber made it to number 12 on the New York Times bestseller list for the week of October 29th, 1995, and was ultimately on the list for three weeks. My recollection of this book is perhaps a little tainted by how the people on the Force.net message boards hated it. In rereading, I was interested to find that while I mostly remembered the Callista plotline, some of the other stuff I had completely forgotten. The only reason I remembered any part of Dalla's plotline was because there is a piece of art by an artist that depicts when she poisons all the warlords. But yeah, I'd forgotten that she came back and that she was there with Palayan, of all people. And the hut plotline, yeah, I, I did not retain very much of that from my earlier reads. And I think it's so interesting now that if you say Darksaber, you think the Darksaber from the Clone Wars and from Rebels and now from the Mandalorian TV show. But back in the day, Darksaber was this book and the failed hut super weapon that it deals with. And on the Princess Leia costume count, yeah, we don't really have much here. Anderson's not interested in what she's wearing, which I find interesting because I find that he does describe what Han's wearing, but mostly in a, oh, Han's, uh, he has to be wearing a uniform, uh, his collar's tight. Come on, Kevin. <laughs> if you can describe what Han's wearing, you can describe what Leia's wearing because I'm sure that what she's wearing is much more interesting to read about. So a brief summary. Durga the Hutt comes to Coruscant claiming that he wants peace and an alliance with the New Republic, but Han and Leia are sure that the Hutts are up to something. Meanwhile, Callista is very upset that she is unable to use the Force as a consequence of what happened at the end of Children of the Jedi. So she and Luke set out on a road trip vacation to get her force powers back. And meanwhile, Admiral Dalla has finally made it to the core worlds and she is consolidating her base of power. In a way, Darksaber feels like a reunion tour, but not a good reunion tour in that we visit so many of the locations from the original trilogy. In the very, very beginning, Luke and Han are on Tatooine and they're pretending to be sand people making their way to Java's palace because they need information about the huts. And then on Callista and Luke's vacation road trip, they start out going to a swanky comet resort, but then they go to Dagobah and then they go to Hoth. And meanwhile, the Huts are constructing their super weapon in the Hoth asteroid field. Sometimes in Star Wars books, it feels like they throw in those movie locations just so that readers will go, yes, I know what that looks like. And I got a little bit of that sense here. I'll go into it in further detail later, but I don't really understand the choices that Luke makes on his road trip, but I'll get into that. The characters... Mm. And they're here. Leia's once again feeling pressure, being the chief of state, sort of doing diplomatic things. But Anderson's not very interested in the political side of her job, so we just get that, like a snippet of that. And then the rest of the time they're just flying around in ships and shooting things and exciting things. Similarly, Han's not really going through a great amount of character development or arc here. He's here. Luke is troubled, this time about Callista, but it seems that in many of these books he's troubled. I guess to misquote Kermit the Frog, it's not easy being a Jedi. 
And Callista, who I really liked in Children of the Jedi, I thought she had a good sense of humor, a really good attitude. It's just mopey here. At the end of Children of the Jedi, while I got the sense that she was sad and confused that she was no longer able to use the Force, it wasn't going to become the sole defining facet of her character like it does in Darksaber. Callista can't be happy with Luke because she can't use the Force. Not that all of a sudden it's like a sense that was always there is gone and it's almost as though she's blinded. No, she's upset that she can't use the Force because if she and Luke have children and then their children can't use the Force, that's, that can't be. They both need to be powerful Jedi for the next generation of Jedi. And it's such a weird attitude too for her to adopt. No one thinks less of Han because he can't use the Force and he's married to Leia who has great Force potential. No one thinks less of any of the other characters we've met thus far who aren't Force sensitive. So the fact that Callista's whole identity revolves around the fact that she once could use the Force and now she can't use the Force and she's just, she can't live like this. <laughs> I, I don't understand this. Wedge is here. He's still dating Quishush. I don't particularly understand their relationship. I don't really see what they see in each other. In Jedi Academy Trilogy, he was assigned to be her bodyguard and all of a sudden they like each other. They're in a relationship. There was no buildup and the reasons why they got together aren't clearly defined other than, oh, these two people find each other attractive. I guess that's really all you need, but I apparently I want more. Kype Durin is back. Uh, he is now a full-fledged Jedi Knight after a year, maybe, of being a Jedi trainee. The Jedi Academy timeline for turning out Jedi just seems so abbreviated and fast, but uh, I guess that's what happens when all the Jedi die and you really need to get ones out there doing stuff in the galaxy. He's still this bundle of anger though, which is strange because part of Callista's problem is that she finds that while she can't use the light side of the force, she can use the dark side. And Luke's like, no, Callista, you can't do this, no. But Kypes just constantly seems to be operating in a state of anger, but that's not dark side apparently, because he, he, that's all sorted. He, we got that figured out in Champions of the Force, it's not a problem anymore. The huts are not particularly interesting. In an interview that I'll link in the description, Anderson said that for the hut plot, he was inspired by sort of what happened during the Cold War, where first we only had the US and Soviets with nuclear weapons, but then pretty much a bunch of other people got weapons. So in this case, we have the huts, who are the galaxy's equivalent of gangsters, trying to build their own Death Star. It goes about as well as you might expect for huts because they try to get things the cheapest they possibly can and their workforce is not particularly good. It's bad, there is no quality control here and it's ultimately their undoing. I guess to the point that it makes me wonder why the other characters in the book seem to take this hut Death Star, the dark saber as such a threat Guys, if the huts are building it, can't you just assume that it's gonna be crappy and it's not gonna work well? And I don't understand this overpowering drive to find out what the huts are doing and stop them because, I mean, what ultimately happened was the huts tried to fire their super laser, it didn't work, and they got smashed between two asteroids and the hot asteroid felt. Dala? is an interesting character. She is a loose cannon. Anderson originally intended for her to die at the end of Dark Apprentice when Kype Duran set off the Sun Crusher missile that blew up the Moonflower Nebula. But apparently his readers loved Dala, wanted her to come back, so she lived and she lived through the end of Champions of the Force and she apparently limped her way to the core world where she's been trying to figure out who's in charge. The answer is that no one's really in charge. There's a bunch of warlords and they're all fighting each other. So Dala essentially makes a power play. She comes in league with Palayan, who seems unlike his Thrawn trilogy self. 
and has this grandiose plan to just attack the New Republic. But in typical Dala fashion, it doesn't go super well. She <laughs> loses her ship once again. She resigns from her position and she says she's gonna help the Empire, but I don't know. It, for now, it is the last we will see of Dala. If I remember correctly, she'll come back in Planet of Twilight by Barbara Hambly, but for now, that's it. She's done. I would say that Dala has learned from her mistakes in the Jedi Academy trilogy, but once the attack on Yavin 4 starts to go bad, she just reverts back to typical Dala. She's just madly shooting. She hits her own ships. She's a mess. <laughs> I would say I love messes, but she gives off this Mary Sue quality that makes it hard for me to like her. And Pelayan is odd. Anderson mentions in the acknowledgments that he had help from Timothy Zahn for the character, but this Pelayan, it's almost like he took a step backwards after the death of Thrawn. He's nervous. He's not willing to take command for himself. The Chimera, I don't know what happened to it. He's in command of a Victory Star Destroyer for one of the Warlords, and he just defers over much, I feel, to Dala. This is also the first time in a book where we get a description of him having a mustache, which I don't remember him having in the Thrawn trilogy, but I believe that the comics of the Thrawn trilogy portrayed him as mustachioed. So, okay, I, I guess that's where that started. And the other Jedi continue to just be only vaguely fleshed out or ciphers. We've got Kirana T and Streen and Cam Solusar and Tion, and that's pretty much it. All the other Jedi trainees, we don't get their names. They're just there, nameless Jedi trainees. Mara Jade appears and has a weird conversation with Callista where she acts as though they have never met before, but they definitely met at the end of Children of the Jedi, and then talks about how she and Luke didn't have a relationship. I don't know if this is meant to foreshadow Luke and Mara Jade getting together in the Hand of Thrawn duology later on, but it was just it was weird. It was a weird, unnecessary conversation. I do have to say that in the acknowledgments, Anderson thanked Kenneth C. Flint for Tatooine stuff, and that was really exciting. And now I understood what he was thanking him for, because having read The Heart of the Jedi, Luke has significant interactions with sand people. So even though the sand people in Darksaber are not nice and not friendly, it was cool to see that maybe a little bit from that canceled book still did, if not make its way into another book, at least help one of the other authors. So. My main issue with this book, if you were going to say, was it the Callista plotline? I would say, yes, absolutely. It was the Callista plotline. Yeah, I had a lot of problems with her single-mindedly only wanting her force ability back and not being able to do anything without it. At the end of Children of the Jedi, Luke's like, there's so much you could teach us, but she's not teaching anyone. It almost seems as though without her force ability, she just doesn't know what to do with herself. Surely there's a lot she could teach that you don't have to have the force to directly show. At the pivotal battle at the end, she just was like, oh, they're a team and I'm not part of it. And that's when she makes her suicide run against Dala's ship. And a weird addition that I don't remember from Chill No Jedi is not just that she can't use the force, but that Luke can't sense her in the force. She's essentially like a void, and the only times that she shows up is when she uses the dark side. That was also sort of weird. People like Han, they're not absences. They just can't use the Force, but you could still sense them as a living person. But Callista's just like not there. I said about Children of the Jedi that I didn't like the moral implications of how her plotline was resolved in that book, but this is, this is weird. There's not really any discussion of she's not able to use the force because she did something she shouldn't have, that perhaps in taking someone else's body that the force was not cool with that and that she's being punished. I mean, I guess there's sort of the implication when Tion tells her the story of Yulik Keldroma, 
But in his case, other Jedi forcibly cut him off from the Force, and no one did this to Callista. It just seems to have naturally happened. I'm also confused by Callista's repeated idea that if she and Luke have children, because Callista currently can't use the Force, their children might have no Force ability. I don't know if the Force works like that. I mean, all you have to do is look at Han and Leia's children to see that you have a Force-sensitive individual and a non-force-sensitive in individual, and they have three force-sensitive children. So I don't, I don't know how force genetics work. And their let's get Callista's force ability back road trip, the comet is boring. It's supposed to be this romantic place, but I would not find a place where all the furniture is made out of ice. Romantic. That's, that's not romantic. That's like in Twilight, how Bella would talk about how Edward was like an ice cube. That's, that's not romantic. No, 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 no. And then I guess they're going to places from Luke's past that he can introduce her to. So they go to Dagobah and nothing remains of Yoda's house. And I thought maybe, oh, I know, Callista will have to go in the cave and it will give her a vision. But Callista doesn't go in the cave. They pretty much just like hang out and then they get attacked by bats and she uses the dark side and then they get back in the ship and they leave. And then they go to Hoth and they get attacked by Wampas who are led by the Wampa that almost killed Luke in the beginning of Empire Strikes Back. And they get away in their ship and they almost freeze to death. And they're picked up by Han and Leia and they go back to Yavin 4. The Imperials attack, Callista runs off to sacrifice herself, and that's the end. Why are they going to Dagobah and Hoth? I guess because it's part of Luke's Jedi journey, but all that Hoth is good for is that that's where Obi-Wan appeared to him and told him to go see Yoda. And it's like a freezing cold ice ball planet. Why not go to places that were significant in Callista's life? Like they could go to Chad, her home world, or they could go to Bespin, which is where her master lived for a while. Or why don't they go to some particularly important Jedi worlds? I'm sure that Anderson could have pulled some out of his butt. But no, we just get retread of old locations. And they're pretty much the same. It's they go to Dagobah, they're talking, they get attacked, they take off. They go to Hoth, they talk only a little tiny bit, then they get attacked for a very long time, and then they take off and they almost die. And then they go to Yavin 4 and they get attacked. I'm not saying that we needed less action scenes, but could we perhaps have had a little bit more variation in our action scenes? So in short, Darksaber finishes off for now Callista's plotline and also sort of wraps up Dala, but it's just this like bloated, boring mess. Our main characters are here, but they're not exciting. They don't go through a lot of development. Callista is now seemingly fixated on she's nothing without the Force. There's this hut plotline, which I can see what Anderson's going for there, but it's just not interesting. I guess I feel about Darksaber what I felt about Jedi Academy Trilogy. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of content. It's just a pity that I don't find it interesting and I find it a slog to have to read through. So next time I'll be jumping into the second of the short story collections, Tales from Jabba's Palace, edited by Kevin J. Anderson.